the second uh, person presenting today is Hunter Tura, um, who is the president and chief executive officer of Bruce Mao Design, uh, where he's responsible for the overall strategic direction of the firm, global recruiting, and uh, business development. Um, many of you are, are probably young, too young to remember uh, the kind of full lineage of Bruce Mao Design, um, but I think it's a, a remarkable institution um, in what it does now uh, and what it has done in the past. It has always been, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, does graphic design, it does book design, um, but I think more broadly, um, really sort of are conceptualizers of environments, and those environments are sometimes books, they're sometimes museums, uh, they're sometimes magazines, they're sometimes identities. And I think that idea that graphic design isn't simply um, choosing a font and a color type and a, a line type, but that it actually, um, and, and, is, and even goes beyond just defining identity as a kind of branded thing, but really becomes helping clients and institutional institutions conceptualize uh, their position. And, and I suspect sometimes um, people like Hunter and others at the team at Bruce Mao have a better sense of the potential identity of institutions than the institutions themselves. Um, so as I say, they've, they've, they work on the one hand with huge corporations like Coca-Cola, Unilever, Nike, Holt Renfrew, um, Harvard University, et cetera. Um, and then they've worked with um, the AT&T Center for Performing Arts, the Lincoln Center, the Pulitzer Foundation, um, museums, and so forth. Before joining Bruce Mao Design, Hunter was managing director at 2x4 in New York, um, and uh, also worked previously at uh, AMO and Rem Kulhas. Um, he is served as design faculty um, at UC Berkeley in Columbia at the Boston Architectural Center um, and has his degrees from uh, his BA from Haverford College and his MR from Harvard. Um, and I will, I will say as a kind of segue, when I arrived at Harvard um, as a post-professional student, Hunter's reputation, he and his partner Jeannie Kim, who's now uh, associate Dean at uh, U of T, we, we knew about them for years before we actually met them. Um, they, they were sort of like, people kept saying, there are these two amazing people in the school and you, you need to meet them. And actually, I'm not sure that we ever met at Harvard, funnily enough. So it was really particularly delightful when, they, um, when we heard they were moving to Toronto. I think it, it took 10 years and a different city to get to know them a bit better. So with that, I will turn, turn it over to Hunter. Uh, thank you for um, quite a unique introduction, Lola. Um, and thank you to Isla for, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to Instagram this, so just give me one second, okay? <laughs> I mean, I'll take the picture now and I'll post it later. <laughs> um, although Hans gave me some good content that's already up there. I'm going to talk about, um, I, I talk a lot about uh, contemporary creative practice in various forms. Uh, it's a particular area of interest to me. Um, and uh, it, it's actually nice to talk about it in this context. Um, I have a remarkable uh, or a, a very high degree of respect for this program uh, as a potential future employer of you guys, uh, your predecessors have done amazing work for us and I'm a huge fan of the school, so it's, it's a great thrill to be here. Um, normally when I, it's funny, I, I have stopped being invited to talk to architecture students and I'm now frequently um, invited to speak to uh, business schools and it's kind of weird shift in, in your life that you're no longer relevant as a designer but somehow industry views you as, as uh, important. Um, but what I typically talk about is 21st century creative practice, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Um, if, normally, I'm not so interested in talking about myself, um, and there are a whole series of reasons why that is. I think my autobiography in that sense is relatively unimportant. However, for today, um, you'll have to indulge me in a little bit of a preamble uh, as to how I got to where I am. Um, which hopefully is edifying in terms of uh, 
some decisions you may be facing in your own uh, careers. Um, we're going to start this story in uh, 1992, uh, so over 20 years ago. Uh, this is me uh, at a uh, party uh, in university. I was on the rugby team then, so I'm carrying a few extra pounds, I think. Um, and I was, at the time, uh, a kind of semi-failed uh, historian, uh, muddling through a uh, kind of thesis around uh, 20th century totalitarian regimes, um, which still influences my managerial style to this day. Um, <laughs> but I was trained to be a historian, and um, as part of my degree requirement uh, in, the, in the Russian history track in particular, I needed to uh, fulfill a series of art history um, courses. Um, so I'm in this art history class uh, at Bryn Mawr College in 1992, and, um, I, and I was sitting next to a girl that I was kind of interested in and wanted to get to know. Um, and as the class let out, I noticed she remained in her seat. Um, and given that this was now my opportunity to talk to this girl, uh, I remained in the room. Uh, and it was a, a course called The Form of the City. Uh, and it changed my life. Uh, and within minutes, I knew that design, architecture, urbanism was what I was passionate about. Um, and I'm sure uh, the, the academic community of historians is thankful for that decision. Um, so I, I did my first undergraduate degree in an in a interdisciplinary program called the Growth and Structure of Cities. Um, coming out of school in 1994, I really knew nothing about uh, how design practices work. I answered an ad in the New York Times uh, for a kind of studio assistant PR marketing person, uh, and I actually got hired. Um, it's amazing to me now that there used to be a full section of the paper with help wanted ads and you would scroll through and actually circle where you might want to work and fax resumes in. I mean, it seems so archaic now. But I got a huge break and I got hired by uh, this guy, uh, Jim Polshek, who had been the dean of Columbia through most of the 70s and 80s uh, and ran one of the, uh, certainly one of the best run, but a very design driven uh, firm, a uh, large New York modernist firm. Uh, that, that worked on a lot of large-scale institutional projects all over the world. So it was a, it was a fantastic entree for me into uh, both architectural practice and, and New York. Uh, I was coming from Philadelphia. Um, the only other competing job offer I had at the time was to be a draftsman in a, um, a firm that did sort of traditional houses, let's say. Uh, they offered me $16,000 a year. Uh, and when Jim offered me 23, it was kind of a no-brainer. Um, so I, I went to Polshek and did uh, two and a half years there, uh, which was an amazing learning experience and a great platform, um, which allowed me to uh, then go to Harvard, where I guess I established some kind of reputation. Uh, they gave me the, the sign to carry on our graduation day. Um, Frank Gehry was the uh, honorary degree recipient that day, so this was, this was design's kind of moment in the sun there, I think. Um, I talk, I talk a lot about my experience at Harvard, um, uh, and the anecdote that I give is I was in Saudi Arabia not too long ago um, speaking with a prince, and his kids had all gone to Harvard. So he asked me what I studied there, and I told him that I learned two things at Harvard. Uh, one, the power of networks and the power of ambition. Um, I did take a Master of Architecture degree, and I have used it in some senses since then. But I do uh, want to underscore one of the things that Isla said earlier about uh, the exceptional nature of an architectural education and the, the way we're trained as architects and the ability to synthesize lots of different kinds of information I think is, is quite unique. And in my view, it's one of the best forms of education if practice itself is maybe not one of the best ways to make a living or, or whatever. Um, I have a different set of opinions on that, but I'm very pro-architectural education in that sense. Uh, at Harvard, I had the amazing opportunity to do my thesis with Rem Kulas uh, and working uh, as part of the project on the city group. Um, 
we, the group that I was um, in uh, was looking at Rome uh, as a, um, a control case study, let's say, to um, all of the conversation around what globalization was doing to cities. Um, and it was really an amazing, um, amazing thing to conduct this research, to go out and lecture at different universities uh, in the world, uh, meet with different scholars, architects, and so forth, talking about uh, our findings. And it really began to position my career in a kind of global conversation around design, cities, architecture, and so forth. I then um, was lucky enough to, to go to work for REM, a uh, very different experience working for him than, than it was in the academic context, although as a nice transition, one of the first projects I worked on uh, for REM was um, a 50-year uh, planning study for Harvard where, if, if you know the project at all from REM's publications, uh, he famously proposed to move the Charles River, um, which uh, the complete uh, act of hubris alone was worth um, recognizing. Um, but it, it made a lot of sense on many levels, but it also meant we were dealing in, with very broad, uh, larger uh, issues for the, the organizations that we were working for. And so my architectural career in that sense already was took kind of a hard left turn off of what you might think of uh, as conventional. Um, one of the amazing parts about uh, being in that, that universe was the network of people that have come through. Uh, I'm lucky enough to count many of these people. Uh, I'm, I'm like way down here. Ola Sheeran gets the headshot, but you know, I'm, but I made the page. Um, but the amazing network of friends and collaborators that still forms a kind of, um, uh, Hans was talking about this, this generation, um, a generation of like-minded uh, practitioners that, again, by now at where I am in my career, having stepped out of architecture, uh, I'm no longer competing with all of these guys. I'm, in fact, helping to support their efforts. And uh, it's led to a series of, of really amazing collaborations, um, some of which I'll show in a bit. Uh, in 2001, uh, I was living in New York City, uh, working for REM, and 9-11 uh, um, obviously was an uh, incredibly traumatic thing to live through in New York, uh, literally uh, seeing you know, your city destroyed. Uh, and I was working for REM at the time to uh, develop a set of editorial strategies for Lucky Magazine, which if anyone knows, it's Condé Nast property uh, dedicated to shopping. Um, and I felt that, you know, the, the, the seriousness with which I had pursued my career, somehow developing um, a shopping magazine to, you know, for 14-year-old girls really didn't feel like the most meaningful thing I could be doing with my career. And I actually took a step back at that point and decided that, uh, you know, I was going to try to practice architecture with a capital A uh, in, in the kind of... Um, the, the way that one might expect uh, from someone with my training. Um, so I went to work for a year for Hugh Hardy, um, who ran one of the, you know, a really good, solid New York modernist practice. I designed this dorm at UCLA. Every time I, I started an office in LA in February, uh, I drive by this building uh, every time I go to LA just to remind myself uh, kind of where I come from. Um, and then I worked on, I moved a year later to work for David Rockwell, um, which again took me in a kind of another strange direction. So although I was building, I was building in a way that was always heavily branded or, or there was a high uh, degree of, of um, graphic design, let's say. Um, you know, we, we worked on, uh, the great thing about working for Rockwell when I was there was literally you would be brought in, briefed on a project, um, you know, and they'd say, um, you know, can you work on this? And you'd be like, yeah, sure. When when is the presentation? They'd be like, well, the client will be here at four. And so literally, you had to get very, very good about 
um, developing design concepts very quickly and visualizing them very quickly. Um, but you know, this uh, this was a project we did uh, a proposal for uh, Cirque du Soleil in Montreal uh, for their casino. Um, so you know, we were we were trying to push, um, let's say, the the design language uh, to new places um, with the opportunities that we were given. Um, but I was working on this thing. Uh, this is a children's hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I was the project manager on this. Uh, it was a very large project, $350 million. Uh, I was not the lead designer on it, uh, happily. Um, and there was a weird thing that happened here, which is that this project had a 12-year project cycle. So this is in, what, 2003 or four. I came onto this. Uh, it has recently finished. This building is now complete. Uh, but as I looked at the prospect of dedicating potentially one-eighth of my life to this building, um, and it's a, it's a worthwhile building. I mean, the, you know, it's, it's healing kids with cancer, and, uh, you know, it's an important building in its community. But it wasn't important enough to me to basically stake my career uh, on that. Um, I also have a fairly short attention span, so the, the 12 years sounded like a really long time. Um, at the same time, there were literally six months between phases, and so I was left alone to start entering competitions, start trying to do my own thing. I won a competition to redo the interiors at the Harvard Club in New York City. Um, you know, so I was beginning to try to build my own architectural practice. And uh, it was, I remember the day vividly. Uh, it was August 4th, uh, 2005. Um, I had just won the Harvard Club Commission, and I was pretty much set to uh, go on my own. And I get a call from uh, Michael Rock, uh, who was the, one of the founders of 2x4 in New York, uh, who basically uh, asked me if I knew anybody, because uh, they had lost the person who kind of ran the business side of their practice. Um, and he said, you know, it's about this much money, which was twice as much as I was making as an architect. Um, I was about to have my second daughter. Uh, and I was about to do something almost suicidal in retrospect, which was go on my own, so giving up all my benefits and, and everything else. Um, we literally, uh, over martinis uh, that night, had a handshake deal. Um, and I started a two-by-four uh, a few months or a few weeks later. Um, the interesting part about this is, so this is the moment where I now break officially with, with architecture, although we continued to work with a lot of architects on a range of projects, CCTV, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but people, people focus on this moment and ask me about, uh, it must have been so different, right, to, to move from one to the other. Um, but in fact, to have reached that kind of management level working on the children's hospital to then go and run or help run a business, um, it was a lot of spreadsheets. It was a lot of meetings about money and people and resources. And what was weird is I never saw almost any difference between what I was doing as an architect, quote unquote, at that phase of my career and what I was doing uh, as the managing director at 2x4. But what was great about it uh, was that and I went from basically a project every 12 years to 70 projects every week. And there was an incredible amount of output, you know, fashion shows for Prada, you know, wine bars that we launched in Hong Kong, you know, huge spectacles for Nike. This is, we, we were given Mercer Street in Manhattan and turfed the entire thing and built this kind of crazy stadium, you know, for Serena Williams to, you know, come launch a, a, a new product or whatever. Um, and it was just an incredible um, range of outputs. Um, we, it was an expansive moment for that practice. Um, we started the office in China. Um, and it, it brought me to places, this is me in Mongolia, uh, for example. Uh, it brought me to places that I never thought I'd go. Uh, and it allowed me uh, to do something that was quite natural, which was to really, um, and when I say network, it, it has a kind of, um, it, it almost sounds cynical, but I mean, one of the things that I've always 
felt strongly about is maintaining the connections and the friendships that you have. And I think it's one of the important things to recognize also as a student that um, these are, th this group of people that you're with now are going to be fundamental to your success probably in some form later on. Um, and it's an amazing thing now where I'm pitching to architects and I walk in the room and there's a GSD person, for example. It's like, you know, it, it immediately cuts through a whole set of uh, skepticisms that, that come along with uh, trying to win design business. So we were doing a project in uh, Hong Kong for Chanel. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone knows this building, but uh, Peter Marino was the architect. Uh, and we were given the entire LED skin of the building uh, to basically develop a series of dynamic uh, animations. And what began to occur to me was that uh, architecture, as I had understood it, and design as I had understood it, and had been trained, uh, there was a fundamental shift happening. And I, that's where I began to really think about uh, contemporary practice, because all of a sudden there was this thing where the architects have given over the legibility uh, and the urban experience of their building to someone else, right? Which is unthinkable in the kind of modernist uh, formulation of, of the importance of the role of the architect. And at the same time, there was a whole new set of practices emerging that were specifically dedicated to doing things like dynamic facades, right? But you wouldn't call them design firms exactly. They weren't media firms. You know, they were in this new, in this particular case, this new emerging uh, sort of almost discipline of display, right? And so I began to think about that a lot. And I began to think about what that meant for uh, architects uh, in terms of challenges and also the opportunities that uh, were out there for other kinds of designers or uh, thinkers who could leverage architectural thinking. Um, this is the uh, this is a Google Analytics uh, analysis of uh, the frequency of the um, uh, number of web searches for the term entrepreneur, right? Since uh, what 2004 or five, um, and you'll notice there are a bunch of spikes, but more or less it remains consistent. You know, the, I'm always interested in what the spikes are, whether that's you know Facebook going public or whatever. Um, but if you contrast that with uh, architect uh, as a search, you can see that uh, although starting from a, a higher place in 2004, the interest in what it means to be an architect from a global perspective is clearly uh, in a kind of steady decline, right? So it begins to speak to um, the role of the architect and the importance of the architect in relation to other disciplines. Now, when I came through school, you know, the, the most binary uh, kind of understanding of what you would be like as an architect would be boiled down to like, are you the kind of Howard Rourke heroic genius uh, from the fountainhead, or are you the kind of Peter Keating sort of corporate sellout, right? And we were trained, at least in my experience, more on the Howard Rourke side. That was the kind of expectation. And then you would slowly see classmates or peers drop off into this other thing, right? Uh, they were also the ones who were like buying townhouses and stuff like that. But uh, uh, there was, this was the kind of binary formulation at the time. Um, obviously, um, you know, when you think about entrepreneurialism within our architecture, um, and if you think about entrepreneurs most simply as people who start and, and maintain businesses, there's a great history of it, right? I mean, if you look at Harrison and Bromowitz and Philip Johnson and all these guys, these are the architects at Lincoln Center. It's only Bunshaft who takes over someone else's firm uh, uh, in SOM. But at the same time, the public awareness and public understanding of design disciplines and entrepreneurialism outside of architecture has taken a whole, uh, has gone in a whole other direction. And this is now how we think about innovation uh, in design. And if you think about a guy like Mark Zuckerberg at 21 years old or 22 years old being the person of the year on the cover of Time Magazine, 
Contrasting that with Daniel Liebskind at whatever he was here, 61, uh, finally making the cover of Time. I believe this is also the last architect to appear on the cover of Time. And I can't see the date, but I, is that 2008, 2009? Um, you know, again, it speaks to the, the cultural relevance of an old way of thinking about uh, how architects are developed. Um, this is probably a reality that many of you guys um, experience. Um, I don't know where this is, which architecture school in the world, but the tragedy is it could be any of them. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and then to begin to think about what your life looks like in practice. So, you know, if you're lucky, you might end up in a place like uh, Foster and Partners. It's an amazing place to work, you know, beautiful view of the river, great buildings, et cetera. Uh, but there are a lot of people. You know, you might end up in a place like uh, Work AC, you know, uh, smaller, um, ambitious, et cetera. And if you're really lucky, you know, you might end up at the table with, uh, with Brad Pitt, you know. Um, but those are relatively, there are relatively few seats at that table, right? So what, what do the rest of us do? And another tragedy around architecture, at least in the American context, but I suspect similarly in the Canadian context, is so much of what's possible is also governed by uh, contracts and standard form agreements uh, from the AIA and so forth. Which is not to say that architects haven't tried to do other things. Um, you know, Michael Graves famously, you know, developed the line for Target and began to uh, at least popularize the notion that uh, architects could uh, from outside their kind of core practice begin to do other things and become somewhat entrepreneurial. But in our own work, um, you know, we have had to balance between this kind of entrepreneurial world, this architectural world, um, but I'm going to show just a few projects that are in the service of architects, um, you know, branding, uh, large-scale developments, um, developing new products uh, and bringing them to market. You know, we work with a lot of different architectural firms on visual identity systems, uh, web, and so forth. I always say about Studio Gang that all the people and all the buildings were so good looking, you just had to line them up and you could scroll through. Um, uh, books, uh, this is a book we're working on now with uh, Matthias, Hol Matthias Holwich. Uh, exhibition design, wayfinding, you know, large scale graphics in buildings, uh, second wine bar of the day. Um, and this is, this is just a quick video of a project uh, that we're working on in Hong Kong. Um, I talked before about uh, Chanel in Hong Kong and how that changed was kind of fundamental in, in how I thought about the change in contemporary practice. Um, this is another project that has also um, changed my thinking. And, and one of the topics that I've been talking about recently is this notion of urban branding, uh, brand having displaced the government and public's appetite for uh, planning in the traditional sense. So as I was trained coming through school, looking at cities, you know, we believed we could move highways and rivers and so forth. But what's more likely is that when you're asked to go and work in urban spaces, it's street furniture, lighting, banners, uh, kiosks, large, small-scale architectural interventions. And so, you know, what you're seeing here is a, a fairly ambitious urban branding package, actually. And so what I found in my career is that although I was trained like Howard Rourke, I'm asked to perform like Beck, where really what I'm doing is taking fragments of existing things and trying to recompose them in some way uh, to try to propose something new. Um, and it's, it's a generational thing. It's a, it's a more tactical thing, I think. Um, but this is the reality of contemporary creative practice. Um, we have flipped our organizational model to meet the needs of that practice. Um, I talk about the Superman model, which was kind of the Howard Rourke thing. Um, but when our founder left five years ago, we had no choice but to, 
to build a new model, which uh, I call the Avengers model, which is team-based, um, highly collaborative, highly iterative, but a very different model than um, still most designers are, are trained. So I talk a lot, and I, I appreciated Hans' remarks before, I, I talk about the 21st century role of the designer not as an author, and not to think as an author, but to think as an editor. Um, and, and I'm working on a, a project right now, and I've just come back from teaching in Denmark, specifically on how to become better editors, uh, because it's our responsibility as 20, 21st century designers to think editorially. Uh, this is Gordon Lish's uh, edit of um, a Raymond Carver uh, text. Um, but I think some people hear the editor and think of constraints. I like the notion that you can be an editor uh, and there's almost unlimited possibility. So I'll end on that. Thank you. <laughs>